God wants to destroy Sodom. And uh, when we come to this part of the story here and we're introduced to Sodom, we, uh, we see the depravity of the city. So these two men come into the city and they, uh, uh, the, men, the men desire these two male angels. And so the, the depravity of Sodom is just seen in its sexual depravity especially. Now it's not that everyone in the city was uh, sexually depraved, although per verse 4 is a pretty inclusive passage. It says, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. So that's meant to be broad, and, and yet, you know, it's just a, just characteristic of what, uh, of the sinfulness of this city. And so we can understand God's desire to destroy the city because of its sinfulness. And we know from Abraham's intercession that there's not even ten righteous people found within the city. So it's just deplorable and it's depraved and, and uh, they are sinners before God and, and God uh, is going to come and, and uh, bring judgment upon this city. Now, before we become too harsh upon them and say, oh, you know, who, who's like that? We're not like that. We're not that bad. But during the time of Jesus, the unbelief against Christ is is seen in the face of the miracles that he's doing and, and the people refuse to unbelieve and it says that if um, if these miracles were done in Sodom they would have repented and so you know we can we can look at them and say oh how terrible uh, what they're doing is and it is terrible it's absolutely terrible but it's a it's a picture of um, unbelief against Christ that all people who do not believe uh, experience and so you know young and old Male and female, uh, uh, any, any sin of unbelief against Christ is worse than this. Worse than this. That's why Jesus said, if they had seen these miracles, they would have repented. And so, you know, there's the call to uh, stand true for the gospel, stand true for the word of God in the society in which we live. And we understand that uh, our true stance, our, our being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that, that is important. And... Uh, uh, we, we should stand that way for the sake of the people that they might see it and hopefully repent. And so we need to stand up and share the gospel in this world. And that's seen in the stinky Sodom here, this, this uh, sinful Sodom and, and uh, their, their sinfulness before God. Now, the angels come, and they're not called angels until verse 15. It's kind of interesting. They're called the men. The men. Um, they come in verse, they, they come to the city in order to deliver Lot, basically. Well, actually, they come in order to bring judgment. It says in verse 21, verse 22, hurry, escape there. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Basically, you know, they have come to the city in order to bring destruction on it, as well as save Lot. And, uh, and so we, we come to talk about Lot. And Lot is going to be saved from the destruction against Sodom, but barely. But barely. Now, uh, Lot is righteous and he's grieved by the sin. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says this. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. So he sees the wickedness of Sodom and he's grieved by it. That's what Second Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 say to us. But to find the righteousness of Lot in this, you really have to look hard, except in his plea to the people of Sodom to not do this horrible thing um, against the angels there. You, you kind of see it in verse 9, in their condemnation of him, mm -hmm. that this one came in here and he keeps acting as a judge. That's right. They, they, uh, he so still sta he stands out almost as if he's not accept, has never been accepted. And he's probably never been accepted because he's withstood their immorality. So, yes, that, that would be another pointer to his uh, possible righteousness. But, you know, <laughs> there's, there's some pretty s strong negatives that you know, stand over and against those couple of righteous statements there. First of all, uh, he sits in the gate. And uh, that, that probably is a reference to 
him being a leader of the city. Now, not that there's anything wrong with being the leader of the city, but you know, if you're going to be a leader in a in such a situation, um, you would have to be grieved continuously, or you know, you would have to leave. You, you just cannot, you, you just cannot stay around that kind of depravity as a leader of the church. And um, like the verse that Philip uh, mentioned here, uh, um, where is it? Uh, that you. Yeah, the, uh, they press hard. Which verse? Um. Yeah, he keeps acting as a judge. So, so that might be another um, just support that maybe he was a leader of this city and uh, he continued to act in, in this way. Uh, so that's not necessarily a negative, but in light of all of the depravity, you have to, under, you have to ask why you know, does he continue to put up with all of this sinfulness? But uh, be that as it may, you know, that may or may not be a negative. Um, however, uh, when, when the men of the city come and they surround the house and they want these two angels, now, now notice that uh, Lot extends to them hospitality, just as we saw that Abraham did. You remember that? We talked about the, the hospitality that Abraham offered these two men. Well, Lot also offers them hospitality. However, their acceptance is not as quick as it was of Abraham. For some reason, they say, no, no, we're going to go stay out in the square. Now, um, he wants to take care of these two men, but when they come knocking at his door, he also wants to appease them. So you've got the, the, the people of Sodom who are coming to do this horrible thing with the two men, the angels, the male angels, and you have the two angels, and so Lot is trying to... Uh, fix it on both sides to the point where he is willing to sacrifice his two daughters to them that he's willing to turn them over now you know you can say this was a cultural thing and you know that the daughters are female and that, 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 there's there's just no way you know th th this is just a, you know he, he's willing to go to extremes to uh, to appease them um, and you know, but but the the degree to which he's going, or or the 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 path that he chooses in in order to bring this appeasement is just deplorable. I mean, how could you offer your two daughters that way? And maybe I mean, just imagine being the two daughters, because the focus is going to turn to the two daughters towards the end of the chapter. And just you know, they they say here we there's nobody to preserve our father's line, and so let's do this horrible thing to our father. Um, so it, it's just a, just a terrible situation here. And uh, he persists in it. They, they don't want it, but he continues to try, continues to try, even to his own harm. And then the angels themselves have to intervene in order to spare Lot or to deliver him from this whole situation that he has gotten himself into. So that's just a negative towards Lot, in my estimation. And then... Um, when it came time to destroy Sodom, he lingers. And it says that in verse 16. While he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful to him, they brought him out and set him outside the city. So the angels again have to intervene, this time to get Lot to move out of the city. He, he just... He's holding, it's, it's like he's just holding on. He doesn't want to let go. He doesn't want to believe that it's as bad as, as it seems to be. He's just lingering. He's holding on. And it says that the Lord being merciful to him, and, and that's really what it comes down to, God's mercy on Lot. Um, so, you know, we want to say, well, Lot was delivered because of his righteousness. Well, in the end, it always comes down to He's just not righteous enough, really, and it comes down to God's mercy. Um, it's a picture of, you know, we're not saved on our own merit. We're, we're just saved by the grace of God. And then, you know, as this is unfolding, Lot argues. You know, here he's being graciously delivered from Sodom and its destruction, and yet he argues. No, I don't want to go there. Let me go there. You know, we, I can't handle it over here. And he, he's putting up this argument to the angels, and and, you know, if, if I was Lot and I, I was in Sodom and the angels came and said, look, get out of here. Sodom is going to be destroyed. 
I'd be on my way out, and it doesn't matter where I'm going, just as long as it's out of Sodom. You, you understand? But to sit there and to go back and forth with um, the angels, uh, again, that, that's just showing that he's just kind of holding on to what he has. He doesn't want to let it go. And in the end, he doesn't even go to that city, you know, Zoar. He doesn't even go there. He goes up into the mountain and, and he dwells there. So he was afraid to dwell in the Zoar, it says in verse 30. And then he's, uh, uh, after this whole thing is over, he allows himself to get drunk twice and this thing to happen to him. Now, you know, you could say, well, his daughters made him do it. Come on, he's, he's, he's their father. They didn't make him do it. Now, I understand he's gone through a real traumatic experience, right? His city has been destroyed. His wife is gone. And uh, he's got nothing. He's dwelling in a cave. And so, oh, woe is me. I'm going to get drunk. You know, I just can't handle it. And, and that, that's fine. There's actually a verse that says that. If you're in woe, you know, you know, drink. But, uh, but that's just the way of the world. This is not the way of the godly. This is not the way of the righteous. So he allows himself to get drunk, not once, but twice. And I'm assuming that because of his drunken state, he's not fully aware or, uh, you know, of what's going on with his daughters. But even, even being drunk, I, I can't imagine not being aware of what's going on, full, even though you're not aware of it fully. But I, I don't have any experience by which to judge how he would even let that happen. Well, it says he, does not, he did not know when she lay down. That's right. He didn't know. So, you know, he's just drunk to the point where he just... Uh, he's gone. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's beyond buzz and uh, he's just completely unaware of it. So, anyway. That's just great. Um, just another strike against Lot. And then, in verse 29, it says, It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain. Now, now look what it says here. That God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. That verse seems to imply that Lot is spared for Abraham's sake and not just, mere, not just his own sake. So, so all of these things, Lot is saved, he is, but, but just barely, you know, he, he is just showing the, the, same, the same character that picked the cities of the valley to begin with because of their lush and uh, their, their uh, fruitfulness and the plenty that they offered, the, the same characteristics that caused Lot to choose the cities of the valley to go live there, namely Sodom, is the same things that's, that's at work just uh, that he's struggling with throughout this whole uh, thing. Let's uh, keep our finger here and turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. And I'm going to read verse 28. And this is uh, referring to the destruction of Sodom. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Lot is, mass, um, Lot is mentioned in this passage and uh, referring to the end days uh, is, is like it was in Sodom. So keep your finger here because we're going to come back to it in a minute. But um, there's a warning not to be so wrapped up in the world that we fail to see what's going on. In other words, the people of Sodom, they were so wrapped up in their day-to-day -day life, right? What does it say? They uh, drank, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And then they were destroyed. It was, it was, uh, there's another verse in Matthew that talks about the days of Noah in the same way. Um, just oblivious. They're ob oblivious to God, they're oblivious to his righteousness, they're oblivious to their failure to line up to it, they're oblivious to their impending judgment, even though, especially right here at the end, there are some signs to that. And so uh, those are the days of Lot in the, leading up to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Any comments? I don't know. It kind of, it almost makes me think of people who are like, I want to go to heaven. I'm holding on. 
I'm holding on to the stuff of the world yeah. so much that God has to yeah. drag me out of Yeah, we, we were talking about that in Sunday school this morning in the sense that, um, you know, we're, we were talking from a passage in First Timothy chapter 4, and it says, um, you know, meditate or practice these things. And let your, let your, uh, let your uh, progress in the gospel be evident to all. We were talking about that in Sunday school. And we were, we were asking the question about, you know, what is it about being a fanatic, a fanatical Christian? You know, wh why is that kind of a turnoff to people? And basically it comes down to, there, there's, a, there's the love of the things that are all around us that we hold on to, that we don't see the value of Christ. We, we don't see how much better he is. We just can't see that. He is so much better than anything that we might hold on to here. And so, uh, so yeah, you know, you're, you're going to heaven feet first. You're kicking and screaming. You're holding on to, you know, it's like your kid, you know, when he's in rebellion. And he, he's holding on to his toys and you're dragging him by the feet. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not like you dragging him. But, you know, just uh, the whole idea of kicking and screaming and just uh, going but with a fight and and, and so that's how we are so often with the things of the world. We just, uh, you know, hold on to them so tightly, not realizing that Christ is so much better, not worth holding on to anything. Um, so, yeah, and, and it's unfortunate that, uh, that we would not see that. So therefore, we're supposed to preach and exhort and, and uh, encourage and uh, rebuke and correct with the word of God so that we can learn how to see the value of Christ and the value of the gospel more than the things of this world. So, uh, anyway, that's Lot. Now, we've got to turn to Lot's wife also, because uh, Lot is on the fence, and he happened to fall on the right side. Lot's wife is on the fence, she happened to fall on the wrong side, and she became a pillar in her community. I just had to share that. <laughs> I've shared that before, but... It's just so funny every time I think about it. Um, you know the story. The angel said, don't look back. Don't look back. And they're running out of there. They had to be led by the hand to begin with by the angels. Don't look back. Lot's wife looks back and she turns into a pillar of salt. And that's just so, uh, again, if Lot falls on the, the one side by the mercy of God, by the grace of God, Lot's wife fails. She falls off the wrong side. And she perishes. And, and she loves her life, just like Lot apparently did in so many respects. She loved her life. She loved her possessions. Even though there was this, even though there was this horrible sin going all around, and I can't imagine that she would have been caught up with it too, but maybe she was. Um, um, so even in the midst of the destruction, even when the fires of God's judgment are falling, she still looks back. And that's just, uh, that's just amazing. It's, it's perplexing. How, how can you love? Even in the midst of destruction, you can love your things so much that you look back. So uh, anyway, let's go back to Luke chapter 17. And it just simply says here in verse 32. Uh, this is one of the top three shortest verses in the Bible. Verse 32. But let me read in verse 31 first. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. And here it is. Remember Lot's wife. So she becomes an example of, um, in that day, don't turn back to get your goods. Just flee. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So uh, Lot's wife just stands as a testimony <laughs> against loving the world to the point of holding on to it. And, uh, you know, if we, if we make a comparison here, one taken and one left, we have Lot and his wife, the one, you know, escaped and the one was left, you know, to, to suffer the consequences of it, uh, if you will. So, uh, 
or you could flip that around and come at it from a different angle. But, but there you have it, you know, Lot's wife just loving the world uh, to the point of her destruction of her doom. Uh, remember Lot's wife. So uh, that's Lot and uh, Lot's wife. Any comments about Lot's wife there? She's remembered forever in the New Testament even. Not just in the story here in the Old Testament of, um, of loving the world and the things of the world. We have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's pretty straightforward there. And, uh, and so we come to the end of the chapter. And what uh, the daughters of Lot do to him, there are two children that are born out of that incestuous relationship, those incestuous, incestuous relationships. You have the Moabite, Moab, the, the uh, father of the Moabites, and you have ben who is the father of the Ammonites. And the Moabites and the Ammonites are going to, they're going to have contentions with the children of Israel from this point on. It's, they're going to be, it's going to be a problem. And, uh, and it all goes back to this whole sinful, um, sinfulness that takes place in this chapter. What a low chapter we have in Genesis chapter 19. And uh, basically, you can't go anywhere, but you can't get any better from this point on. It can't get any lower, is what I mean, after this point in Genesis chapter 19. And I think it actually stands as, as kind of a transitional chapter to um, the, the work of God in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, uh, all the way from this point to the end of the book. All right, any final questions, comments on chapter 19 of Genesis, Philip? I guess one other thing that kind of, with Lot, he and Abraham separated because they had such great herds and wealth that they couldn't coexist and then here he is in Sodom and he flees and is left with nothing mm. but even still he doesn't go back to Abraham and make peace with Abraham mm. Mm. he yeah. stays in the cave yeah. um, that's right he stays in the cave he bemoans his existence <laughs> and, and you're right and that's a good that's a good uh, just a good contrast to make there you remember when they separated they were both wealthy. So here's Lot. He goes into the city, a wealthy man, and he's coming out with nothing. And, uh, you know, the, the last we hear of his life here is just an abomination of the sinfulness present in his family. So you, you really have two ways here. And again, you know, the, and the New Testament calls him righteous, righteous Lot. He was delivered. And he's probably the only righteous one. And, and he is called righteous because of his maybe reaction against the sinfulness of Sodom, but, but still, you know, he, he's like, uh, what, what does that passage say? The, the one who is he saved, lies. but, huh? As yet one out of the fire. That's right, just as one just that is barely escapes the fire, you know, that's, um, that, that's Lot, as opposed to the prosperity and the blessing that Abraham experiences because of his continued devotion to God. So, love the world, if you will, but, um, the best, you can ex the best you can expect is to be like Lot if you're going to hold on to the world. The lesson here is to leave the world behind. There's nothing in this world that's worth trading for the presence of God in our lives. And if you have tasted and seen the goodness of God and the mercy and the grace of God in your life, you know that there's nothing, no joy that can substitute for that. And so that's uh, the lesson for us. All right, let's uh, move on to 